20 years ago, I wrote a book called I Want to Change the World. Uh, I was criticized heavily for it in some countries. For example, the French said that I was very arrogant by saying this comment, by saying that I want to change the world. But what I really meant was that collectively, this world can be a far, far more progressive, more innovative, smarter, more beautiful world. But in order to do it, we have to shape it. And I always see design as a cultural shaper. That's what we do. We shape culture. And design, we shape the future. So by working with the present, we make lives, make better lives for the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years for humankind. Now design is not a selfish act. It's really, in a way, a bit of a selfless act because if we're good designers, we may have a vision and a language and a way of looking at the world, but our intent is for others. So if I design something as simple as a bottle and we make 20 million here of this bottle, I am touching 20 million people's lives. So I cannot think about myself. I need to think about others. Now, when I think about others, you know what I think about? I think about how I navigate through the world, and I find most of the time, the world not working well. We have a plethora of problems in the world. So with the objects in our daily lives, the things in our lives, the spaces in our lives, why don't we try to make them more engaging? In other words, why don't we humanize our built environment and our virtual environment? The average person touches 680 objects a day. Isn't that amazing? That means that those objects are going to have a huge impact on your mental health, on your physical health, and on your well-being. If you design objects <clears throat> that are easy to use, that are simple, that are biodegradable, that are sustainable, that are smart, that are innovative, that actually are even inspiring, because sometimes when you touch something and hold something or work with something or walk into a space that's inspiring, how do you feel? You feel alive. And design can shape this world for us to feel alive. Now, we are what I would call in the epoch of redesigning, not designing. Why? Because a lot of archetypes have been designed over and over and over again. The chair, we've designed over a million chairs. So you as a designer, when you design a chair, are you designing? You're redesigning. And in redesigning something, what you do is you bring a nuance of originality to the project. Design does not need to prevail or exist if there isn't something new or original in it. Why? because we've exhausted the world with commodity. We have more commodity than we need. And we have 8 billion people on this earth. We have 1.2 billion cars in the world. So the question is, when you add something to the world, you need to subtract something else. Simple formula, addition by subtraction. In other words, can I add to the betterment of society by taking away? Yes, so if you design a good product, you can take away three products. If you design a good idea, maybe you take away 10 bad ideas. So we can actually edit, and I see designers in a way as cultural editors. Now, why I say design shapes the future and it's about the present is because if I think about the criteria of every project we do, and I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm asked to design a mobile phone. Okay, I just worked on a phone with Oppo in China. If I work on a phone, everything about the phone today is of the latest, latest technology, number one. Everything about the mobile phone today is about the latest use interface. Everything about the phone today is about the latest materials. Everything about the, fo the phone today is about the latest production processes. So if you design a mobile phone, you have no reason to look into the past for inspiration because you could argue that the past is irrelevant. In other words, if you design, you have to be focused, highly perceptive of the present. Artists don't see the future, they see the present. Everybody else sees the past. But if I look into the past for inspiration, then inevitably, I'm not really designing, am I? I'm styling. And what is style? The Italians call fashion designers stiliste, stylists. They call architects and designers architecti. Why do they make this differentiation? Because stylists are educated to look into history to be inspired. But how do designers become inspired? They look at the contemporary criteria. I can be inspired by the factory. I can be inspired by the new material. I can be inspired by the new social behaviors of how we live. For example, we live in the casual age. So I design around the casual age. What's the casual age? The casual age is easy, high performance, technological, soft, engaging. That's the age I live in. So I look at the present to shape the future. And that's design. So you could argue that design is about embracing, engaging contemporaneity. 
and look at our contemporary world. The digital age has afforded us to do have far, far, far more experiences, more connections, more knowledge, more engagement, more seduction, more pleasure than the physical. And for 50,000 years, human beings were engaged in the physical. So the physical world was so important to us. When you bought a car, you kept it for 25 years. And every Sunday you wash it and take care of it. When you bought a camera, you took the lens off and polished the lenses and took care of it for 20 years. The world has changed completely because the average person today looks at a monitor for seven and a half hours every day. So almost half of your waking day, you're looking at a screen. It's a new world. So interestingly enough, the digital age has afforded us a dematerialization, a reduction in the physical world. And the world, in a way, is becoming less interested in the physicality. All the world's investors, all the money, all the businessmen, all the focus is in the digital. Why is it in the digital? Because it's new frontier. It's new territory. It's the first time in human history that we have the digital age. 50,000 years making permanency, making heavy, making things that we thought would last forever. Today, we make things that have one year lifespan, two year lifespan, one week lifespan, one day. So the world of disposability has happened quite quickly now, but for 50,000 years, it wasn't about disposability. It was about permanency. And as we dematerialize, the big question is, what do the physical things bring us? Does the physical thing around you, the table, the chair, the life, the board, are they bringing you something that is as enriching, as engaging as the digital ages? There's a time when you walk into a hotel on a trip, and you walk in the lobby, and you look at the lobby, and you engage the lobby, and you look at the room, and all the physical parts were very important. Today, most people, when they, go out, when they travel, this is important, the screen. So my agenda, and I think design is going in this direction, is to take you from the screen, distract you from the digital age, and show you how beautiful the physical world can be. But if the physical world remains the now, dull, boring, colorless, not tactile, not engaging, then we don't compete anymore. So we need to design to make this physical world as profound, as beautiful, as, as connective, as global as the digital age. We are also living in what I would call the epoch of transparency. And what is transparency? Transparency from a social political point of view is things like WikiLeaks, meaning that you cannot really get away with anything anymore. That our identities are exposed that the world has no secrets, that corruption will disappear, that the borders and boundaries of the world will disappear, that the one world that we started with, we are going back to it again, we will become one world, that the only differentiation between all of us will not be culture, territory, religion, creed, race, no, the only difference will be between your fingerprint and your fingerprint. In other words, the only difference is between each one of us. And we are all born as individuals, we are all born original, and we are here to do something on this planet that's original. So I always think about every time I put pencil to paper, if I'm going to design something new, it has to have something original in it. And if it doesn't, what am I doing? I am just making a derivative of history. And do we need another derivative of history? Do we need another similar chair? Do we need another same knife and fork? Do we need another auditorium? Do we need another same table, etc.? No, so it's better to not produce. Because if we're going to produce, let's innovate. And I always say that design is inseparable from technology and inseparable from innovation. Those three always, always should go hand in hand. So design is not decorating. It's not superfluous, superficial, and dormant. Design is the modus operandi for making the world better. And of course design can change the world. If you design at one time to make coffee was a laborious process 200 years ago in Brazil. Today to make coffee, you make a little capsule. Put the capsule in, you press a button. Perfect coffee. The other reality is, you don't need all the baristas and all the coffee shops. You need the capsule. That evolution of that object is like the evolution of many objects. The evolution of the mobile phone used to be a facsimile machine, a printing machine, a, 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 a landline telephone, an answering machine. It used to be all these objects. There's about 40 tech objects that have all gone into something this small and more. It's your camera, it's a video camera, on, on, on. That's design. That's the streamlining, the reduction of things that we don't really need in the world anymore. So the less is more, Mies van der Rohe, 
or Adolf Luce, who said be less is more, or, or less is better, Dieter Rams, et cetera, et cetera. That's the direction we're moving into. But we have to realize that when we say those words, we're not talking about minimalism. We're not talking about something austere or cold or removed. We're just talking about less. But the less should be better, softer, nicer, more human, more pleasurable, more inspiring, more creative. This is the world that we need to shape. Now, the other thing about transparency is, is honesty. And I think moving forward, the future of the world is honesty. Because dishonesty was part of the analog age. You know when the first DVDs came out, or CDs for software, they were put in big boxes on the shelf. Big, big boxes. The hi-fi equipment, stereo equipment, was in big black boxes, but there was a printed circuit board only this small inside. Why did we do this? All the market employees were about this notion that you felt that bigger means that you get some value for the money you pay. Today, we pay money for nothing, for digital information. So we've learned that the honesty is about getting better with less. The other part of the epoch we live in is called the epoch of creativity. And there has never been a time in history where the majority of human beings now are empowered to create. We all are can create. And isn't it interesting that we're given the tools to create, free tools. You can make music, you can make 3D anything. You can make thousands of renderings of architecture, or objects, things, whatever you want, whatever you imagine today. You have a software, a tool to do it. And we're all doing it. So we have the power or the empowerment of creativity. Now, what's interesting about that is, we are born to create. Every one of us was put on this earth to create. Create two ways. Procreation, have a child. Intellectual creation, we shape the world. So, finally, after 50,000 years of homo sapiens and humanity, every one of us are having an opportunity to do what we're on this earth to do, to create. To be is to create. That's why we exist. And to create means originality. And that's why you have this fingerprint which is only repeated one every 40 billion. Lastly, we are living in the epoch of the entrepreneur. I remember in the 1990s being in Tokyo, and there was a lot of controversy about young students graduating, how they all had to go and work for large corporations for the rest of their lives. And there were a few radical students who were going around Japan lecturing to encourage other students to start their own businesses. It was unheard of in Japan, as it was in many countries, and still is. But you look at a country like Sweden, 8 million people, they have 30 brands you can name right now. Because the country itself encouraged for 60, 70 years entrepreneurship. And what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is saying that, hey, I have an idea, and I can contribute to this world, and I've got something original, and I have something to offer. And the digital age afforded everybody to be able to disseminate their ideas. So it's one thing to create and no one sees your work. It's another thing that you have the digital age, you create, and everybody can see your work. How amazing a time is that? We are fortunate that we live in the schism, the turning point of the analog to the digital age. And the digital age is only 40 years old and the analog is 50,000. Isn't that amazing? We're only at the beginning of this. We don't even know what's gonna come. We are the pioneers, like the pioneers. We are the pioneers of binary notation of the digital age. That's the time we live in. And design needs to understand this and embrace this huge change that's taking place in the world. But you know what design is doing sometimes? And many designers are doing, they're looking back. And why are they looking back? Fear, because they are afraid. Why are the politicians looking back? Why do we have all the political chaos in the world at this moment in time? Because that generation is afraid. Because they were in the analog age. And they don't even really understand what's going on in the digital age. Because what's going on in the digital age is, it's free, it's democratic, it's for everybody. Everybody has a voice, everybody can create. There's no boundaries, no borders, no territories, no jingoism, no racism, no patriotism, etc. Design has to embrace that. And when you make something physical, talk about this time in which we live. And this time in which we live is 16,000 satellites, a wireless world with everything possible. Thank you.